Ashwin. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debate, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It is 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's. Tonight, shocking pictures of acid attacker Abdul Azidi. As it emerges, he was granted asylum despite failing the Christianity test. Also, what is the government hiding? How many asylum seeker sex attackers are in Britain? And... Someone in an official job uh, treat me like this. I, I, I don't feel safe in this country. I speak to the Israeli brothers hounded by border force, plus... Ministers have announced their resignations today, with both James Heapy and Robert Hulfen stepping down from government. Rishi Sunak's cabinet ministers quit. How long can he limp on? Also, should people who cut their nails on public transport be fined? And don't say it. Don't say it, anyone. Don't. No. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. What is the government hiding about asylum seeker sex offenders? Next. First of all, the news and the latest developments from the United States, where President Biden has pledged full federal support to the Baltimore Bridge Rescue Operation. Video footage captured the moment a freight ship stacked high with containers crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge at around 1.30 this morning local time, captured on camera if you're watching on television. That collision plunging cars, their drivers and construction workers into the water below with no warning. We now know the vessel involved in today's crash was reported to have structural issues in 2016 and in the same year was also involved in a separate accident when it hit a port wall in Belgium. Let's show you the scene live in Baltimore, in Maryland, in the United States right now. Ah, well, I would have liked to have done that, but unfortunately, we appear to have lost our live feed. But I can tell you that it's very much an ongoing rescue and uh, recovery operation. Six construction workers remain unaccounted for, and the governor of Maryland has been speaking to reporters tonight, saying that search and rescue mission, rather, not recovery mission, rescue mission is very much ongoing in the city. We'll keep you updated throughout the rest of the evening.
Now, as you've been hearing, chemical attacker Abdul Azidi was granted asylum by a judge who accepted he was a Christian convert. Despite concerns, the sex offender was a proven liar. A range of confidential court documents show the lengths Azidi went to prove his conversion from Islam, including signing an agreement to be escorted during church services as a result of his criminal past. Meanwhile, pictures also released for the first time show him being baptised and also handing out Christian leaflets in a shopping centre. Azidi's body was pulled from the River Thames last month amid a major manhunt after he was suspected of dousing his ex-girlfriend with a corrosive chemical. A former British Museum curator has been ordered by the High Court to return stolen artefacts within four weeks. Dr Peter Higgs, who was dismissed for misconduct, faces allegations of theft and damage to over 1,800 historical items, accusations he denies. The courts also ordered him, though, to disclose records from his eBay and PayPal accounts following claims he listed hundreds of the items stolen for sale online. Julian Assange's wife has said today that a decision to delay a final appeal on her husband's extradition to the United States is utterly bizarre. US authorities have been asked to provide assurances on whether the WikiLeaks founder can rely on the US First Amendment, which provides a right to free speech, or whether he might face the death penalty. A further hearing is to be held in May. It's over the disclosure of national secrets following the publication of leaked documents relating to Afghanistan and Iraq war. The pizza chain Papa John's has announced plans to downsize its business in the UK, closing 43 so-called underperforming stores. The takeaway business has undergone a review into its profitability and plans to increase investment instead in research and technology. The company hasn't confirmed how many staff will be impacted by closures, which will take place in mid-May. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GP News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gpnews.com slash alerts. We deserve to know how many asylum seekers have committed sexual offences in Britain. We are paying for them. They live amongst us. We deserve to know. It is our right. Yesterday, we brought you information from Denmark. They published violent crime conviction rates by nationality. It shows that Danish nationals rank 42nd on the list of violent crime convictions. People from Kuwait, Tunisia, Somalia, Morocco, Iraq, Afghanistan, Turkey, Pakistan, Algeria, they all rank much higher. But what we want to know is about how many asylum seekers commit sexual offences in Britain. It's important information. This is why we're so keen to find out. Researcher Jack Anderton has been through official data from the Office for National Statistics and other sources. This is what he found. The North East has taken the highest number of asylum seekers per head of population. That is apparently 25.4 people per 10,000 as of December 2023. In the North East since 2014, sexual offences have increased by around 500%. Stalking and harassment appears to have increased by around 6,000%. It also appears that crimes such as shoplifting and burglary have remained relatively stagnant. So, the big increase here seems to be sexual offences. Now, it's important to say there may well be no correlation at all here. It may be a complete coincidence that a large influx of asylum seekers has coincided with a large increase in sexual offences. There is no concrete proof that the two are links, but we believe the British public have a right to know either way. After all, this is part of the country where Kuwaiti and Syrian refugees have just been convicted for being part of a grooming gang that raped and abused a teenage girl. Now, Tory MP Neil O'Brien said the Home Office and Ministry of Justice hold the information, but they refuse to publish it. Well, this makes us wonder, are they hiding something? So we approached them ourselves. Now, initially, the Ministry of Justice sent us to the Home Office. The Home Office sent us back to the Ministry of Justice. This, by the way, happens all the time. So we submitted a Freedom of Information request asking the following questions. One, how many asylum seekers are in prison for sexual offences or awaiting trial? Two, how many people with a pending visa application are currently in prison for sexual offences? Three, how many foreign nationals currently in prison are repeat offenders? Now, here is their response. 
We can confirm the MOJ holds all of the information you have requested. However, to comply with the request, as it currently stands, would exceed the cost limit set out in the FO. IA. Information collated centrally by the MOJ does not include details of if a prisoner is an asylum seeker or has a pending visa application, nor does such information specifically indicate the full criminal history of any prisoner, whether foreign national or not. This would require linkage to other collated data. So we are going to pursue this all the way here at GB News. We think you have a right to know. Now, I will emphasize again, there may well not be a link between an increase in sexual offences and an increase in asylum seekers to a particular area. But we have to know for sure, don't we? We simply cannot continue in Britain having a debate about asylum policy, the same asylum policy that allows sexual criminals like Alkaline Attacker Abdul Azidi to live in this country without the public and our politicians being able to have the full facts at their disposal. There may well be nothing to hide. So, if there is nothing to hide, then tell us because we're going to keep asking. Let's get the thoughts now of tonight's panel. I am joined by GB News presenter and star Emily Carver and the new Deputy Chairman of the Conservative <laughs> Party, Jonathan Gullis MP and author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Emily, do we have a right to know how many asylum seekers have committed sexual offences in Britain? Well, I think that was quite a convincing opening monologue there. I do think that people have the right to know. Now, of course, this will make a lot of people, particularly on the left, very uncomfortable, because they like to think that there would be absolutely no difference in terms of the rates, depending on asylum status. But if we look at our asylum system, and this is something that I think feminists might have a bit of a blind spot to, if you look, 2022, 77% of those applying for asylum were male, only 23% were female. Now, some of the most common countries were Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Bangladesh, Eritrea, India, Sudan and Pakistan. Now, unfortunately, women's rights in those countries aren't as high as you would expect in Western Europe. And I think it is not bigoted or xenophobic to suggest that maybe the fact that there are so many men, they're being given priority in our asylum system from some countries where women's rights aren't as advanced as they are here, that that may mm. have an impact in terms of sexual violence. And I don't think we should shy away from that. I don't think we should demonise people on the basis of their asylum status. But I mm. do think that we deserve to know. Yeah. Now, Jonathan, I mean, it could well end up being a women's rights issue, getting to grips with what's going on in the channel, getting to grips with what's going on Ill illegally in the back of lorries. And I, I think we should at least be able to know and have that debate if indeed it is there. Well, I think Emily made a perfectly good point right at the beginning there about the fact that we, sadly and unfortunately, 70%, 77% of these people coming over illegally via a small boat are predominantly young single males. That is, of course, going to raise uh, question marks about the fact that if these are people genuinely fleeing for their lives, why would you not put women and children ahead of yourselves? Uh, so ultimately, I think, as the Ministry of Justice has said itself, as the data, and obviously will, uh, you'll pursue that, and I think it's important data to get out there. But ultimately, we do know who are foreign national offenders. We do keep a track of that. The uh, Lord Chancellor Alex Chalk actually did a really good job recently of announcing that we are going to start immediately deporting people. Mm. Around over 3,000 of these foreign national offenders will be immediately deported for certain offences, low-level offences, rather than obviously keeping them in this country, clogging up prison spaces. But more importantly, sending a clear message, if you come here, you'll be removed, detained and deported as soon as possible, which I think is a positive step forward. Yeah, now look, Amy, uh, yeah, it appears that the North East has had the highest percentage of asylum seekers per head of population, then there is also the fact that sexual assault, stalking, harassment claims have also gone through the roof in that time period. Now, again, I will emphasise, as it currently stands, we absolutely cannot prove one way or the other if there's a direct correlation there. It's certainly worthwhile asking the question, which is exactly what we're doing. How do you feel about that? Do you think that we do have a right to know? I feel like, who could this benefit? If you get this number and it says what you're suggesting, then how is it going to be helpful letting people, letting communities know either way? All it's going to do is increase suspicion and hostility against asylum seekers who are already facing massive amounts of hostility because they seem to have garnered this reputation in the, in the country that there are some, some sort of threat. You've had 
ticket panellists on this on this sofa saying it's a national emergency, the number of asylum seekers that we're taking, when actually we're 19th per capita in Europe. So we're not taking our fair share. Most countries, most asylum seekers will um, get asylum in, the, in their neighbouring country mm. and they don't seem to report these types of things. I think the problem is, is that we take, and in my view, the, the proportion is completely wrong and completely upside down, but we take women and girls from some of these countries that some of these men are coming from, right? Mm -hmm. And they're often escaping sexual violence. And it is unfortunate that in some countries it is more of a norm for sexual violence to be commonplace. That is not to say that we don't experience far too much sexual violence across the board in this country, particularly domestic violence. But, you know, Somali-born Ian Hersey Ali, for example, has written about this, how when you had huge numbers of undocumented men coming through to Western Europe, you did see, unfortunately, Unfortunately, and I wish this weren't the case, but you did see an uptick in certain forms of sexual violence against women, particularly in public spaces. Now, that is something that is very uncomfortable to but acknowledge. Some, you know, it is. And I understand why you don't want to go there. I completely understand. But it is something that, unfortunately, we need to talk about, particularly because some of these women are trying to escape the type of sexual abuse that they experience. I think the reason, I, the reason I don't want to go there is because what has there been a massive upsurge in recently has been these protests outside asylum seeker mm. hotels. There's been um, vigilante attacks on innocent asylum seekers. There's been false rape claims against asylum seekers. Mm. And I just think prodding this bear... Do you think that maybe way... the, the government were more, were more transparent? about this, then it wouldn't be co-opted by far-right groups. It wouldn't be co-opted by people yeah. who want to well, demonise all asylum seekers. I think it's, it's a difficult balance, granted. You but are I think right. you have to be transparent so that people then don't believe the government is but trying to hide something. We'll, we'll invite transparency across the board then and mm. find out the number of police officers who are sex yeah. offenders, find out the number of MPs that are sex offenders. Yeah. You know, transparency at every single level, perhaps, mm. and not just focus on asylum seekers, one of the most vulnerable groups yeah, Go with yeah. Jonathan, I, I mean, I personally think that if if there is a correlation between the amount of asylum seekers in an area and the amount of sexual assaults in an area, any local community, especially the women and girls in that area, would have a human right to know that. If there's going to be an asylum seeker hotel in their place or there's going to be uh, some social housing that's used, I mean, I, I, that's, I think, relevant information for a community to know. Well, look, it? when Amy referenced the amount of people that we're taking, uh, I think what's important to remember is we've taken half a million people since 2015 into this country from places like Syria, Afghanistan and others, as well as, obviously, Ukraine, mm. where we've got the war going on. Stoke-on-Trent was the fifth largest contributor to the asylum dispersal scheme when it was a voluntary scheme. What are we seeing in Stoke-on-Trent? We've seen, sadly, the rise of the far right. We've also seen his book to here, both referenced in the Khan Review, the extremism view, uh, which I know you'll be talking to my yep. Stoke colleague about later on, which is obviously a huge concern because these are people pushing dangerous ideology amongst a vulnerable young uh, community, which is something that I'm very much worried about. And, of course, we've got schools under pressure, the NHS under pressure, local council, which is mm. the second worst for what it earns in through council tax in this country, under more financial strain than ever before. So I think that... Absolutely. I've got no issue with transparency of data. I think it's important. I sit down with my, for example, Staffordshire police uh, teams and understand in each local ward what are the main crimes that are being driven and who, in their opinion, is what driving that. What about the that? fact that only 1% of rapes are convicted? Surely that's something that we should... I, get... I and the fact that our asylum system, our, that we should be proud of, has, has saved millions and millions of people. Well, but can, can I ask you, can I ask you mm. though, do, do you not think that women and girls in a specific area would have a right to know if it is demonstrably proven that there happens to be a link between asylum seekers and sexual assaults in an area? Do you not think that people would have a right to know that? You can be transparent as you like, maybe, and maybe the causation might be a correlation, but I doubt it. And I think the sex offenders register is private and confidential for a very good reason. Uh, Emily, would you not want to know that if you were living in a particular area as a woman? Well, I think, we, I think people do have a right to know, and if there is no correlation and if there is no causation mm. there, then publishing this data shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. All right. Well, look, hey, good start. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Um, a Home Office spokesperson said this. A wide variety of factors can impact crime trends. It's incorrect and irresponsible to reach conclusions without robust evidence. I mean, I would just like to point out we are desperately trying to get the evidence. Police in England and Wales have made significant improvements recording crime. Now... Yes, it is time now for our spring giveaway and it's the final week to see how you could win gadgets, a shopping spree and an amazing £12,345 in cold hard cash. Make sure you don't miss out. Here's all the details that you'll need.
It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Still to come, neo-Nazi activity and young Muslims being radicalised by the banned Islamists, Hizbut Tahrir. It's all happening in Stoke-on-Trent. Local MP Drank Brereton is live in the studio as he begins the fight back against extremism in his area. But up next, six out of ten Brits, apparently, want a formal apology made to descendants of slaves. Should it happen? CEO of anti-monarchy group Republic, Graham Smith, goes head-to-head -head with political commentator Suzanne Evans. It's Patrick Christie's Tonight. We are on GB News. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Is the brand of toothpaste super important here, or is it more about the toothbrush, because I was told a long time ago by my dentist, electric toothbrush, Pip, that is the way to go. You're exactly right. I mean, the action of mechanically removing plaque, so using a brush, is much more effective than the brand of toothpaste itself. But in terms of the ingredient in toothpaste that we're looking for, it's something called fluoride. And fluoride is essential to help remineralize and strengthen our teeth. It's really important to use a toothpaste with fluoride. And in terms of brushing, using an electric toothbrush is just much easier. You know, you're brushing your teeth first thing in the morning, last thing at night, you're gonna be a bit tired in those times. So using an electric toothbrush, you just hold it against your tooth and gum and it does all the work for you. So it's just much easier in my opinion. But you have to use your electric toothbrush properly. You're exactly right, yeah. There is a technique of actually brushing your teeth, although it sounds really simple. With an electric toothbrush, you have to hold it against the tooth and the gum. Ideally, you want a pressure sensor in that toothbrush so you know exactly when you're pressing too hard. But if you're using a manual toothbrush, you need to move it around and small circular motions. But actually, what I see is people who use manual toothbrushes, they tend to over scrub and over brush, which can actually lead to gum recession and your enamel thinning long term. Sometimes I will get up in the morning and I will have breakfast and then I'll brush my teeth. Is that wrong? <laughs> Unfortunately, that's wrong. So the best time to brush your teeth is first thing in the morning, as soon as you wake up. If you're brushing after you eat and after breakfast, you're brushing your teeth in that weakened, acidic state. So your teeth are actually under attack and they're much more vulnerable. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Coming up, MP for Stoke-on-Trent South, Jack Brereton, is live in the studio. Why? Well, he is fighting back against extremism in his city. But first, should the British government and royal family offer a formal apology to the descendants of slaves? It's time for our head to head. So, a new poll has found that apparently 60% of Brits believe that we should apologise to Caribbean nations and the descendants of enslaved people. King Charles himself came out last year to support research into the monarchy's historic links to the slave trade. He also expressed his personal sorrow at the suffering caused and refused to rule out paying future reparations. So, should the King and the Prime Minister go one step further and make a formal apology. Let us know your thoughts. Email me, gbviews at gbnews.com. Tweet me at gbnews while you're there. Go and vote in our poll. I imagine there might be a slightly different result to the one that was done in this report. But I will bring you those results shortly. Now, going head-to-head -head on this, our CEO of anti-monarchy group Republic, Graham Smith, and political commentator Suzanne Evans. Thank you very, very much. Suzanne, should we get on bended knee and apologise for historic links to slavery? You know, Patrick, on the one hand, I think this poll is, is good because it shows that obviously the slave trade is something that we all think is utterly abhorrent and certainly deserves apologising for. The problem I have with this is that no apology is ever going to be enough. And I also think it's somewhat absurd that in this day and age we're talking about uh, asking people who weren't involved in slavery uh, to apologise um, for people who weren't involved in slavery. I mean, the whole thing is really quite absurd, really. Uh, and as I said, no apologies ever going to be enough. The King, as you say, has apologised. The Prince of Wales has apologised. Yes. I remember the family of Gladstone, the former Prime Minister, whose father was a slave trader, has apologised. And in all three cases, we've been told, well, that's not good enough. I'm sorry. No, just not good enough. And then, of course, these calls for apologies are always called by, uh, followed by calls for reparations mm. as well money to be paid. And again, I think no amount of money is ever going to be enough to satisfy these mm -hmm. campaigns. So recently, for example, we've had the Church of England saying it's going to set aside a billion pounds to yes. make reparations for slavery. They originally said they were going to put, put aside a hundred million pounds, which seems like a huge figure in itself, but no, that wasn't enough. So it's been up to a billion. Right. So how do we stop here? That's my question. OK, um, I'm going to go now to the CEO of anti-monarchy group Republic, uh, Graham Smith. I mean, look, surely you would be the clues in the name, Graham, isn't it? You want them to apologise, you want them to abolish themselves, you want them to bankrupt themselves. I mean, come on, you're, this is why you're in favour of it, isn't it? You don't feel the need to actually apologise, surely? Well, yes, I do. I think, I think Britain should, and I think certainly uh, the monarchy should. I mean, Charles hasn't apologised. I don't know what uh, that was referring to. He has not apologised. And the thing is, the monarchy itself, particularly the monarchy, this is a hereditary institution that tells us, look at our glorious past of a thousand years. That's why I should continue. That's why I should be head of state, says Charles. Look at the, the history. You can't do that and then say, oh, but ignore the other bit of the history. Now, the royals uh, instigated, promoted, sponsored and invested in slavery all the way through to its abolition from, you know, uh, Elizabeth and uh, James I and all the rest of it. Did any of your and ancestors, then, Graham, just out of interest, did well, any of I your ancestors? I don't know, but the point is I don't sit on a fortune. Now, Charles inherited an estimated £600 million uh, when his mother died, didn't pay inheritance tax, and a significant amount of that has been inherited down the line from one monarch to the next since the uh, King Georges of the 18th century who were investing in slavery. And, of course, the monarchy celebrated and reveled in the whole notion of empire, which uh, promoted slavery, and then continued it in a different way uh, after slavery was abolished through uh, indentured labor and all the rest of it. So they've got quite a bit to apologize for. And I think reparations, I mean, in terms of how much, well, you know, someone put it very neatly, the clues in the name, 
when these societies are repaired from the damage that we have caused by but I mean, know, that, that, all right, stealing okay. millions Look, of Susan, their okay, people, right, Suzanne, is that not an incredible and killing them and enslaving them? Right. Is that not just an incredibly difficult thing to quantify? I mean, so let's just well, take some of the Caribbean islands, for example, <laughs> like Jamaica. I mean, what, what do we repair it back to? I mean, what was it before the slave trade, etc.? Well, what was it really? The, well, I'm going to go to see that, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go see you. It's about recognising the fact that the chronic... Graham, okay. sorry, Graham, just to say... Graham, I'm going to go... I'll go back to you, Graham, but I was going to bring yeah. Suzanne in on that, on that point, yeah. Like I said, it's never going to be enough, and that's the problem. The other question here is, you know, this argument is very binary. It's always portrayed as though it's Europe against the African nations in particular. Uh, and, of course, it wasn't like that. We know that there were African nations that were complicit in the slave trade, and it couldn't have functioned as it did without that mm. complicity. And yet there are never calls, are there, for African na nations to apologise for their part in it, to make reparations. You know, if you look, look at its most basic level, every single person on this planet today has in some form been a, victor, a victim of slavery or has been involved in slavery. That's a fact of life. So where does this end? You know, we can't go around each asking each other for an apologies, yeah. making reparations. You know, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. There comes a point where we have to draw a line under this historically right. and focus, I think, on modern slavery. Slavery International, Graham, like 50 million people. Graham, what would, would you say if I, if I... Graham, what would you say if I asked you if you were just suffering from white guilt? Well, no, I mean, with great respect, that this, this nonsense about, um, you know, where do we draw the line, it's a little bit of truth. I mean, we can we negotiate with people and say, well, what do we... We agree a point where we stop and we say, well, this is what the settlement's going to be, and that's the deal. Um, and, of course, those African countries that in the 16th, 17th and 18th uh, centuries were involved in uh, slavery, we then, uh, and other European countries, conquered. We had a nice little cosy meeting in Berlin and said, we'll conquer the entire continent and enslave the rest of them, not quite as slaves in the traditional sense, but in indentured labour, taking away their rights, destroying their artefacts, stealing them, mm. uh, you know, uh, sending them off to London and so on. So, you know, we destroyed that continent many times yeah, over, yes. and it's a bit you... rich to then say that they should then start to um, make reparations. It's, you know, there is a systemic, chronic poverty and inequality right across these um, societies because of what European nations did, and it's not unreasonable to make some effort. I mean, is that actually true, that though? Damage. I mean, that, that's that's the issue with all of this. I mean, is that actually true? Because, you know, we've got yes. things like the Barbary slave trade, for example. As, as Suzanne, you know, as you were saying, these slave trades would not be able to function if it had not been for actual African people themselves entrapping their own uh, individuals and then sending them to us. I have a look now where slavery is still prominent, for example. Eritrea is a country where it's still prominent. I mean, there's quite a lot of these. Afghanistan, Turkey, it says here, Tajikistan, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia. I mean, North Korea, obviously, we all know that, don't we? And here. I mean, there's, there's, there's a load of places where slavery is still prominent. We had an issue with it, you know, back in the day. We then stopped it. I mean, seriously, what, what are we really apologising for, Suzanne? I'm paying for well, let's, like I say, I don't think we should really. We should be focused on the very real problem of modern day slavery. There's nothing we can do about the historic slave trade, really and truthfully. It's it's appalling, it's awful, we're all agreed on that. But there is something that we can and should do about modern slavery. You know, 50 million people worldwide, victims of modern slavery, in this day and age is utterly appalling. A quarter of those yes. are children. For goodness sake, let's focus on what we can do something about in the here and now. Let's different... change Lives in the that is a separate issue well, because could, the, the, could, the, the, could I just the ask Graham? Is, yeah, final point, Graham. Sorry, just final point on this. Can I, can I just ask? Look, you know, the, I'm, I'm just reading here the Group Republic. Obviously, you know, perfectly entitled to do what you're doing. You do it very effectively to an extent, although the royal family does still exist. So I don't know how effective to be fair. But um, you know, set up. Uh, years ago, you know, would you be willing to commit to uh, 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 an investigation into the people who founded Republic and all of your members and look at whether or not there's any historic links to the slave trade for any of you? And if there is, you apologise and you pay reparations. Would you be up for that? If, if Republic institutionally, as an organisation, had um, that kind of links, then of course. But, I mean, you know, we were founded in the 1980s, so no, it's unlikely. But, I mean, it, it, this is the point. The, the point is that it's not about go, trying to resurrect the dead slaves from 200 years ago and apologise to them. It's their ancestors 
are still struggling with the inequalities and lack of wealth as a result of that slavery in the same way that we as um, sorry, their descendants. Uh, we, as descendants of uh, the people that enslaved more, more those so, more so, Graham, than you know, look, like we, my we relatives who were like Irish peasant slavery. farmers. I'm just out right, of you think you think that people are struggling more than that? that? Slavery and that empire, in the same way that they're still suffering the consequences of what we did to them, and that is why right. we should do something. And it's not an open-ended, uh, you know, blank check. It's a process where we try to uh, rectify that damage that we did to them. OK, look, both of you, thank you very much. Really good stuff, that. And I no doubt we'll chat to you both again very, very soon. Uh, that is the CEO of the anti-monarchy group Republic, Graham Smith, and political commentator Suzanne Evers. Look, who do you agree with? Should the UK government and royal family formally apologise to the descendants of enslaved people? Vincent on X says, absolutely not. Apologies suggest culpability. Nobody alive in the UK is responsible for centuries-old crimes. Paul also on X says, you can't change history. I'd like to change things so there weren't any wars, famine, diseases, poverty, etc. All we can do is look forward, be positive and live for what we have today. It's not quite zen, that, Paul. Dean on X says, no, everyone should thank and even pay us for ending the global slave trade. You're welcome. Not a lot of shades of grey in the inbox there, it must be said, but your verdict is now in. 97% of you say the UK government and the royal family should not apologise to descendants of enslaved people. 3% of you think they should. Now, coming up. The government was rocked today by a double ministerial resignation. Both Robert Halford and James Heapy, they turned their backs on Rishi Sunak's cabinet. The Spectator's political correspondent, James Heal, joins me to reveal all from a wild day in Westminster and tell you what Tory MPs really think of our Prime Minister. But next, have our northern towns and cities become a hotbed for Islamist and far-right extremism? Banned Islamist terror group Hizb ut tahrir have been running rife in Stoke-on-Trent. Apparently, they've even been running gyms, local gyms, as some kind of grooming ground. Local MP Jack Brereton is live in the studio. He says enough is enough. It's Patrick Christie's tonight. We are on GB News. Hi there, time to look at the Met Office forecast for GB News. Rain and hill snow across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours. Showers moving in elsewhere, although interspersed by at least some brighter interludes. Low pressure still well and truly in charge. That low mainly sitting towards the southwest of the UK and it is sending a band of rain north during the evening into Northern Ireland where some wet weather could cause issues, rain warning in force, as well as central and northern England parts of Wales and then eventually that rain moves into Scotland where it mixes with cold air to give some snow above two or three hundred metres. The far north stays dry but chilly and further south some clear spells although the next area of rain moves in by dawn to affect southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. Heavy downpours, gusty winds and then that rain well it tends to turn to showers as it moves into central UK by the afternoon. Further showers arrive later from the southwest with gusty winds hail and thunder, a lively afternoon, although with some pretty clouds in the sky. Now, in the far north, we're going to see wet and windy weather remain until Thursday morning, and then Thursday starts off bright across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, for England and Wales, a blustery start with further heavy rain to come, followed by showers, and those showers developing fairly widely as we go into the uh, Easter weekend, I suspect, Good Friday, Saturday and Easter day. Mostly, we're going to see sunny spells and showers before more prolonged rain on Monday. Nana Queer. Weekends from 3pm. OK, this is getting beyond ridiculous. Trans women, which, as we know, are biological males, are apparently now going to be included as women in a push to get more female chief executives into the FTSE 100 by it next year. Now, the campaign called 25 by 25 is an initiative headed by Chief Executive Tara Kemelin jones whose mission is to get 25 female chief executives running blue-chip companies by 2025, and it's backed by major companies including Unilever, NatWest and BP. You couldn't make this up. Tara said anyone who identifies as a woman is a woman. What's the point? Seriously, if anyone can say that they're a woman then why bother with this at all? It just makes a mockery of the whole thing. Will the trans woman have a salary of a man or a woman? As we know, there are still major gender pay gap inequalities, and it will be a complete misrepresentation of women and on boards of pay and average salaries. 
Only last month, Tory MPs accused the financial services watchdog, the FCA, of putting women's rights at risk by encouraging banks to collect staff data based on self-identified gender rather than biological sex. Of course, it was met with resistance from some 40 MPs and peers who wrote to the Chancellor to argue that the FCA was taking an activist approach to its diversity policies. This morning, I read about a school, a health nurse who claimed that not all people who have babies might call themselves a she or a woman or a mum. She said that walking through a school in a skirt and letting your hair grow when actually people previously knew you as a boy, well, that's incredibly brave. That's what she said. But I think there's an element of attention-seeking, if I'm totally honest. But the worry is it could lead to a path of medical transition when most people going through puberty are struggling with their gender identity in any case. Biology trumps ideology, and it's time to take a stand. Welcome back to Patrick Chrissy's Tonight. Coming up, Rishi Sunak's cabinet ministers, some of them anyway, have quit. How long can he limp on? But before that, extremists and bad actors are tearing apart British communities, especially in our northern towns and cities. Don't take my word for it. That was the finding of Dame Sarah Khan's astonishing government review. Now, according to Khan, you will struggle to find a better example than in Stoke-on-Trent. So the city has historically been a hotbed for far-right and Islamist extremism. Look, let's just start with the far-right, OK? So, in 2003, the BNP established itself as the main opposition to the Labour Party. Later in 2010, the English Defence League held a 1,300-person march through the city. There have also been cases of historic racial violence against minority communities, and today there is evidence, apparently, of neo-Nazi activity. And then, of course, there's the Islamists. Banned terrorist groups, Hizbut Tahrir and Al Mudjaroon, with a foothold there since the early 1990s, by the way. Usman Khan, the London Bridge terrorist, was active in the Stoke on Trent Islamist groups, as was Kamran Hussein, an imam who was found guilty in 2017 of preaching Islamist terrorism at the city's High Street Mosque. Now, Hizbut Tahrir have their own community centre and gyms in the city. They're also running youth clubs and social activities for women and children. Locals are concerned that they are using these facilities to actively recruit and radicalise young Muslims. And I think that concern is probably fair enough, don't you? Dame Sarah Khan has also told that his Tahrir continually attempt to infiltrate Stoke-on-Trent school governing boards and local MPs say that they discourage and shame Muslims from participating in general elections. Well, Jack Britton is the MP for Stoke-on-Trent South. I'm very pleased to say he joins me now. Jack, I mean, this is incredibly concerning. All of it is. But zoning in on the idea that you've got a now-banned terror group running gyms, trying to get on school boards. Mm. I mean, this is a nightmare, isn't it? Well, it is extremely concerning, and I'm pleased that Dame Sara Khan has shed a bit of light on some of these issues, because we've been seeing, as you've said, these issues have been going on for some time, and we've seen both far-right and Isla Islamic extremism, which is extremely concerning and is leading to some of these issues in communities. Look, what do you do about this now? Because, you know, there's the kind of... The punter in me says... Well, hang on a minute, why can't the police just go around, knock on the door of this, you know, potentially radical gym and close it down? Well, I think, you, you know, we've obviously only just had uh, Hezbollah Tria being banned as an organisation, mm. but they've been operating just at the cusp of what's acceptable, and that is the problem. And now, fi finally, thankfully, we have seen Hezbollah Tria listed as an organisation, and I hope the police are now going to take action to break up some of these activities, because I've been calling, other MPs in Stoke-on-Trent and Staffordshire have been calling for, the, for action against groups like this for some time. I, I mean, when you see examples like this, and, and Stoke mm -hmm. does appear to be quite a good microcosm of this stuff, where you've got elements of the BNP, or had elements of the BNP, uh, you know, the EDL, and then you've got on top of that, then you know, absolutely rampant Islamism, from what I can gather. Is this a visible sign, really, that multiculturalism has failed in some respects, do you think? Um, well, I think there are concerns about that, but I think what I've seen is that this is a minority, it's very much a minority, and most of the community are trying to resist this, and we've got to support those communities, support those communities who are saying, no, this is not what we want to see in our city. Mm. And that is something that I've been absolutely, you know, supporting them in, supporting uh, Staffordshire Police as well with addressing some of these concerns. But we do need to see action to address uh, this, and it is concerning that we've had funding withdrawn to address some of the community 
community cohesion for rent funding that was withdrawn, which actually should have been put in place, in my view, and continued to address some of these issues. What I can remember, I can absolutely remember it at the time when the BMP mm -hmm. uh, won a load of seats at local council. They were very prominent in that area. I can remember a lot of reporting on EDL marches. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can really remember that stuff, and that was really pumped out there by the media. I don't really recall seeing a huge amount of local reporting on you know, his but to rear gym, a community centre. Like you said, they've been operating right, quivering on the edge of, uh, of terrorism for quite a while now. Uh, the fact that they are trying to apparently get on the school boards and governing boards. It does appear as though there's almost been... We talk about two-tier policing. Has there been two-tier reporting on this stuff, do you think? Well, I think some of this has not been reported and, you know, I think it's been convenient in some cases not to report it and what's been going on. And a lot of this is, is below the radar. It is happening um, without people seeing and there is obviously a lot of vulnerability that they prey on as well, uh, both in terms of Islamic extremism and the far right, I would mm. say, prey on uh, vulnerability. But what I think was so visible about uh, the BMP was that they actually won seats on the council. You know, they had nine seats at one point. So they were the official opposition yeah. on the city council, which was, you know, absolutely uh, shocking, really. And they occupied, really, a vacuum that was left by a collapse of the Labour Party uh, in that area. But what we also see, and what I'm very concerned about, is that some of these radical and extremist groups are trying to subvert democracy. They're trying to deter uh, ordinary people, ordinary uh, people from getting involved and voting. You know, and yeah, talk to me a bit about that, because I, I read this in the report that said apparently mm -hmm. groups like Hizbut are trying to discourage some Muslims from taking part in the British political system. Well, what's that about? Well, it's, it's seen as, you know, not right to be voting. It's against their religion, in, they would say. You know, and, and that is, uh, I think, totally shocking mm. to be saying that sort of thing and to, to dissuade uh, people just because of their religion from participating in our democracy. Most of the uh, Muslim community uh, very much, uh, you know, are mm. law-abiding, want to uh, be involved in our community, want to... Uh, be involved in our democracy and, and very much you know, hold those strong uh, democratic views and values. But there are a small minority mm -hmm. who are trying to prevent this. And this is, this is about holding power. That's yeah. what it's about. Very finally and quickly, does it bother you? Do you ever stop and think, hang on a minute, I've got quite a big chunk of my local population mm -hmm. who it would appear mm -hmm. are sympathetic towards a now-banned terror group. And... You know, here you are having very open conversation about it on national television and mm -hmm. no doubt you say this stuff in Parliament as well, etc. Do you feel a threat to yourself at all? I don't feel threatened. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't feel intimidated by anyone, to be frank. Uh, and I think, you know, it would be very damaging if that... But I know some colleagues have been intimidated, have been threatened. I've had one or two threats previously myself, but I, I'm not intimidated. Along what lines do you mind me asking? Or... I don't want to go into Fine, that. Fair but enough. I, you know, I think, you know... The, the threats I've had, you know, and what I feel more concerned about, actually, is my family, uh, my office, my staff. Yeah. Um, you know, I... I uh, we've got to protect them, actually, and it's not just about me as the MP. Mm. Um, it's got to be about those who participate in our democracy. And, you know, as I say, I, I, I don't feel intimidated by no. this. Well, good for you, and thank you very, very much for coming on and talking about what is a fascinating case study of... Yeah. Unfortunately, in some respects, where Britain is today. But Jack Britton there, thank you very, very much. Coming up, well, it's worse than we possibly could have imagined. The Clapham chemical attacker Abdul Azidi was somehow granted asylum despite the Home Office warning that he'd failed a Christianity test and was using religion for his own ends. So, look, does the government have blood on its hands or is it actually some of these immigration judges? Here, my take at 10. But next, not one. But two government ministers resigned today, leaving Sunak a little bit in the lurch. So, with 63 Tory MPs now due to stand down ahead of the next election, is this Conservative Party broken beyond repair or still salvageable? The Spectator's Jane Teal reveals if the Prime Minister is in a perilous state. It's Patrick Christie tonight. We are on GB News. This is GB News. Britain's News Channel. Yeah, well, when it comes to fish and chips, we all know they're a part of a British tradition, and the golden chippy 
is, is an award-winning uh, restaurant. And for years, they've been serving the community here in Greenwich. And even today, on a Sunday, they are fully packed today. But this is the issue. Here we've got a mural and which says a great British meal. Residents who live in this area who've complained uh, to Greenwich Council who say it's inappropriate uh, considering it's in a conservation area. Here's what some of the local people we've been speaking to had to say. What's wrong with it? It looks all right, doesn't it? Do you know what I mean? Look at some of the other feet you've got around in Greenwich. They don't want to take that down, do they? But when you've got something like this, it's half day, so they want to remove it. Fantastic artwork. I really like it. Reminds me of Banksy. Well, those are the views here from people who live in this local area. But I'm kindly joined by Chris, the owner. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. You've been here for 20 years now. Um, tell, tell me how this issue has come up. They take pictures. It's only been up for about a month. And uh, it's been very, very popular. I don't want to believe that any of the locals are uh, complaining that this is uh, too loud or anything like that. They say... It's, it needs planning permission. How a little thing like this needs planning permission, I don't know. Are you working with an artist in this local area? I've got a local uh, guy that uh, does uh, murals, so he said, uh, would you like me to do something for you? I said, yes, why not? I said, make sure you leave a bit of space for people to stand there so they can uh, take some selfies or pictures or whatever they want to do from Golden Chippy. And it's been extremely popular, and not one person has come to me and said, that looks terrible. So I cannot imagine the person that complained about this. I think it's just cancel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. It's Patrick Christie's tonight on GB News. Still to come, I ask how the Clapham chemical attacker Abdulazidi was granted asylum despite Home Office warnings that he'd failed a Christianity test and was using religion for his own ends. I think it's time to name and shame the immigration judges. But first, Rishi Sunak's government has today been rocked by a double ministerial resignation as the skills, presumably ironically named, by the way, skills, apprenticeships and higher education minister Robert Halfen joined Minister of State for the Armed Forces, James Heapy, in leaving their ministerial roles. Both will also stand down as MPs at the next election. Halfen will step down after 14 years in Parliament and quoted the... Oh, Lord of the Rings, saying his time is over. Well, he'd be signed off from his last day as a minister using the military term index, which describes coming to the end of a challenging exercise. Both departing ministers have said that they will continue to support Prime Minister from the backbenches until, of course, they naturally leave Parliament. Now, this brings a number of Tory MPs who have announced that they will not stand at the next general election to a whopping 63. And it leaves Rishi Sunak with the headache of another mini reshuffle of his cabinet. I'm delighted to welcome political correspondent for The Spectator, James Heal, for the inside track on what's really going on behind the scenes. James, thank you very, very much. Do Tory MPs and cabinet ministers dislike Rishi Sunak and now they're leaving? I think it's not even so much Rishi Sunak. I think a lot of them have just given up with the Tories. Uh, you've got lifelong people who are Conservatives here, someone like Rob Hal, for instance, who've given years of their service to the party. And the fact that they're heading uh, for the exit door uh, is mm. very, I think, indicative of the current move within Parliament. And I was speaking to one uh, minister tonight who said there's going to be others to follow as well. Yeah, what kind of other messages have you been getting in your WhatsApps, James? Well, really, I think it's a reflection of the big divide today on defence. So uh, I've been chatting to one who said that, you know, the Conservative Party uh, is not for national defence. 
And then what is it for? And that's a reference, of course, to uh, the big debates we've seen today on defence spending at the Liaison Committee. Uh, and obviously, James Heapy referenced that when he was calling for more uh, defence spending in his very final appearance day in the Commons. So I think that's the big debate playing out today is about uh, defence spending. And we saw that with Grant Shapp's appearance at the Defence Select Committee, uh, where the Chief of the Defence Staff, the Deputy Chief of the Defence Staff, admitted that Britain could not fight uh, an elongated war. Um, and then other messages are just saying, you know, look, we're in a really, really big hole right now. And, uh, you know, every the rats are leaving the sinking ship. Well, so 63 MPs have decided that they literally just don't want to do their job anymore. Uh, we've had, you know, a couple of uh, ministers questioning today. Apparently, apparently, uh, one in four Tory voters are saying now that they're going to vote reform. If rumours are to be believed, they are two letters of no confidence away from uh, having a vote of no confidence. I mean, does he have a duty here to put us all out of our misery and have a general election? The country has got a lot to sort out. And, you know, you can't do it in this situation, can you? Well, this is the big thing, is how much political capital does he really have to use? And uh, can you actually get anything done over the next nine months? You know, this parliament technically can go until next January. Does anyone really think it's going to last that long? Uh, I think the next big thing for him is looking at the, the clock. You know, four weeks away is when we have those May local elections. And that's what I'm hearing from a lot of the right of the party is the next big drumbeat moment. And that's going to be the maximum moment of political danger uh, in terms of the, the upcoming calendar. So really, it's about making sure that after the MPs return from recess, uh, they're able to kind of get some momentum behind the prime minister. Because at the moment, a lot of people are very disheartened in Westminster as they head off for their Easter holidays. Yeah, and... I mean, I, I know, and I'm sure you do, speak to people behind the scenes, there are a lot of people, a huge amount of people, who, you know, with deep regret, just do not feel as though Rishi Sunak can win the next election. And, you know, if they are pushed into a situation where it is a choice between potentially keeping their job or definitely losing it, I did hear a name floated around a little bit over the weekend, and I'm quite keen to get your view on this now. Someone maybe who's interim. Marc Francois. Um, do you think there's any chance whatsoever that we might end up with Marc Francois leading the Conservative Party? Well, I'll say one thing. Marc Francois is definitely keen to increase defence spending, as we saw from today. Um, and I think that on that, he'd have uh, support from some members of the party. But look, I don't think uh, Marc Francois, uh, for all his uh, undoubted uh, enthusiasm in lots of these areas, for, for lots of issues of Tory voters like Rwanda and Brexit, etc., uh, I don't think that's likely, uh, unfortunately for Marc. OK, and just on its current footing, James, do you think that Rishi Sunak makes it to the next election? I do, but I think he'll be walking man wounded. A walking man wounded. Well, I mean, James, that is quite, quite astonishing stuff, actually. It does appear that every single day there's someone else who's quitting, someone else who's having forced to stand in a by-election. I mean, those results that we could get in, in, in May at the, mm. uh, the local elections, do you think that that could end up seeing at least a vote of no confidence in Rishi Sunak? I, I think not, because I think that it, we've got for the past two years, every time there's a vote of no confidence, whatever happens, normally the prime minister wins it, uh, as we saw with Boris and Theresa mm. May, and yet both times they end up going. And so, frankly, once you've got to the stage of a vote of confidence and actually you've had 53 MPs come out and say they want a, a vote of confidence, it's game over in any way. In both those cases, those prime ministers were gone within, uh, I think, about six months. So I don't think we're going to get to that stage. Uh, and I think it'll just be lots of fighting mm. uh, and then Rishi Sunak gets to the election just about. I mean, I, I, the thing I keep hearing over and over again is, look, Rishi Sunak, quite a nice bloke. There's nothing against him personally, you know, but actually quite bad at politics, which is unfortunate considering he decided to go into politics. James, thank you very, very much. That is James Heal there, who is The Spectator's political correspondent. Things it appears looking quite bleak behind the scenes. If you are a Conservative voter, then you are being confronted with yourselves with the situation of whether or not you would like to change leader before the next election. Coming up, I speak to the two Israeli brothers who allegedly suffered appalling anti-Semitism from a border official as they tried to enter the UK. Someone in an official job uh, treat me like this I, I, I don't feel safe in this country. Yeah, their story will shock you. But next, how was Clapham chemical attacker Amdal Azidi granted asylum despite the Home Office warning that he failed a Christianity test? Is it time to name and shame the immigration judges? Patrick Christie's tonight. We're on GB News. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. 
Hi there. Time to look at the Met Office forecast for GB News. Rain and hill snow across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours. Showers moving in elsewhere, although interspersed by at least some brighter interludes. Low pressure still well and truly in charge. That low mainly sitting towards the southwest of the UK and it is sending a band of rain north during the evening into Northern Ireland where some wet weather could cause issues, rain warning in force, as well as central and northern England parts of Wales and then eventually that rain moves into Scotland where it mixes with cold air to give some snow above two or three hundred metres. The far north stays dry but chilly and further south, some clear spells, although the next area of rain moves in by dawn to affect southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. Heavy downpours, gusty winds, and then that rain, well, it tends to turn to showers as it moves into central UK by the afternoon. Further showers arrive later from the southwest with gusty winds, hail and thunder. A lively afternoon, although with some pretty clouds in the sky. Now, in the far north, we're going to see wet and windy weather remain until Thursday morning. And then Thursday starts off bright across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, for England and Wales, a blustery start with further heavy rain to come, followed by showers. And those showers developing fairly widely as we go into the uh, Easter weekend. I suspect Good Friday, Saturday and Easter day. Mostly we're going to see sunny spells and showers before more prolonged rain on Monday. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time round. So why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter our massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GB Win to 84902. Text cost two pounds plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5 pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. You know, I am appealing to Abdul that he needs to come forward to get that medical attention and to hand himself in. It is time to name and shame immigration judges that let monsters stay in Britain. Also, knock the attitude off. We've made the decision and you're coming in. So just let us do the checks we need to do and keep quiet. Look at me. OK, you clear with that? Good. We're the bosses, not you. Israeli October the 7th survivors hounded by border force. They join me shortly and... So let's stick to the plan, that if we stick to the plan, we can deliver a brighter future for everyone. We stick to our plan, and if we stick to the plan... Yeah, you might have a plan, but one in four Tories are going to vote reform. Plus, should people who cut their nails on public transport be fined? I've got tomorrow's newspaper front pages tonight with GB News presenter and star Emily Carver and the new Tory deputy chairman Jonathan Gullis and author Amy Nicole Turner. Oh, and can you guess what's wrong with this? At about 1.30, container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been 
over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware to our trainer by car. What? Get ready, Britain, here we go. Immigration judges are letting violent sex monsters into Britain. Next. First, at a minute past ten, the latest news headlines from the GB newsroom. Well, in the United States, President Biden has been pledging full federal support after a shipping container lost power and crashed into the main bridge in Baltimore in Maryland, dramatically collapsing the entire structure. If you're watching on TV, take a look at this video footage captured of the collision. It happened around 1.30 this morning local time. It plunged cars, their drivers and construction workers into the water below with no warning. The vessel involved in today's crash was reported to have been involved in a structural issue in 2016 when it hit a port wall in Belgium. Before this morning's incident, the ship's crew had notified the authorities of a power outage on board, which left it heading off on the wrong course, unable to change direction, which caused the crash. Let's take you live now to the scene in Baltimore, where six construction workers, who reportedly stopped more traffic coming onto the bridge after it collapsed, remain unaccounted for. And the mayor of the county has said, the governor of the county, rather, has said, it is very much still a search and rescue mission that's on going there in Baltimore this afternoon. In news here at home, GB News can reveal the number of small boats crossing the English Channel so far this year is now 25% higher than at the same point last year. Another five small boats made the crossing this morning, with almost 300 illegal migrants on board, including a number of children. It takes the total number of migrants who've made the dangerous journey so far this year to just under 4,600. That's up from 3,700 at the same point last year. The Education Secretary said today that parents are having to fight for the right kind of support for school children who have special needs. Around two in three schools for children with special needs in England were at or over capacity in the last academic year. The Department for Education says councils will benefit now from an £850 million cash boost. Unions, though, say the plans don't appear to differ from previously announced commitments. In the United States, the musician and rapper Sean Diddy Coombs, better known as Puff Daddy, has had two of his properties raided by federal agents as part of an ongoing sex trafficking investigation. Properties in Los Angeles and Miami were searched by officers yesterday. It's after accusations made by his former partner, R&B singer Cassandra Ventura, better known as Cassie. The 54-year-old has been the subject of several lawsuits in recent months, including for sexual assault. He has denied all allegations against him. And lastly, the King and Queen are to attend an Easter service at St George's Chapel in Windsor. Buckingham Palace announced today that the royal couple will be spending the Easter celebration at Windsor Castle this Sunday. It is the King's most significant appearance in public since he was diagnosed with cancer. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome along. Massive hour coming your way. I start with this. Our asylum system is so broken that we let a twice-failed asylum-seeking lunatic sex criminal con artist burn a woman to within an inch of her life because a judge accepted that he was a Christian, even though he failed a Christianity test. That's a sentence that shames the immigration judges. Let me break it down for you. Abdul Azidi is this Afghan man. He doused a woman and child with alkaline in the middle of a public road and then threw himself into the Thames. He pretended to convert to Christianity so he could stay in the UK, despite having failed in his asylum bid twice. Today, shocking new details have emerged. So this just landed before we came on air. Here are pictures of his sham baptism. There they are. Here are pictures of him handing out leaflets about Christianity to people in the street. Today it's emerged that Azidi failed his Christianity test and was still granted asylum at the third attempt. 
Azidi claimed that the Old Testament was about Jesus Christ and that one of the disciples was called Jacob in a series of blunders during a Home Office interview to test the validity of his conversion. Another new detail today is that the convicted sex offender was only allowed to attend church if he had a safeguarding person with him, presumably in case he decided to sexually assault someone while he was there. He had to sign a contract stating, I will only come to church for the Sunday service. I will not enter the church without one of my male supporters being present. I will stay beside my supporter all the time. I will leave the church when my supporter leaves or before them. This is insane. How can a man who is not deemed safe enough to attend a church on his own be allowed to walk around the streets of Britain with the rest of us? It disgusts me. During his Christianity test, he was grilled about what God created on the third day. He answered, Good Friday, Easter Sunday and Resurrection Day. The judge, named as Judge O'Hanlon, needs to be investigated in my view. Now, how many other monsters have been allowed to stay in Britain? The evidence is this. Azidi was a known sex offender. He had repeatedly lied about whether he was a Sunni or a Shia Muslim. He'd lied about how his brother died, if indeed he had died. He lied about not working in the UK when he was working as a mechanic. He claimed he'd forgotten to mention he was Christian at his first hearing. The Home Office said he was lying. And still, Judge O'Hanlon granted him asylum. Supported with letters from the British Red Cross, a refugee charity and, crucially, from the church. I want to know how O'Hanlon sleeps at night. I want to know what their life is like. Do they live near a migrant hotel? Are they in danger as a result of some of the decisions that they make? Are their daughters being confronted by an Afghan sex criminal armed with a corrosive liquid in the street? Judge O'Hanlon cited a previous Supreme Judge's comments in relation to a Somali asylum seeker. He said, we must be very careful not to dismiss an appeal just because an appellant has told lies. An appellant's own evidence has to be considered in the round with other evidence. We reached out to Judge O'Hanlon for comment by the Judicial Press Office, but were told that judges were unable to comment on cases that they have been involved with. Let's get the thoughts now of my panel. I'm joined this evening by GB News presenter and star Emily Carver. I've got the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party. It's Jonathan Gullis, MP, and author and broadcaster Amy Nicole Turner. Emily, do you think that some of these immigration judges should be made to account for their actions? Well, you know, when looking at this case, a lot of people might be wondering whether it's cock-up or conspiracy. It's starting to look like maybe it's conspiracy, because this is a decision that a judge took against the evidence that he had to grant this man asylum in this country. Why on earth would he rule in this man's in this man's favour. Mm. A proven liar, someone who's changed his story multiple times, a convicted sex offender who needed a male supporter, whatever that means, to keep people safe when he attended church. I mean, the mind absolutely boggles, and what I'm concerned about is whether there are more cases exactly like this one or similar to this one. A lot of people on the left who are in favour of a very liberal asylum system and a liberal immigration system, they argue a lot, that the proportion of asylum seekers who are granted asylum in this country proves that all of the people coming across the channel are, in fact, legitimate mm. asylum mm. seekers. But when we look at this judge's ruling, that shows that maybe they're not, and maybe it's our system and our judiciary that are actually too lax. I think we need to investigate the immigration judges, Jonathan. Well, look, that's why I think the Prime Minister was, in, in fact, wholly correct to make it very clear that if you enter this country illegally, you will not be able to claim asylum, because ultimately, that's one way of ensuring that people who come here, and sadly, in this particular case, very malicious individuals shouldn't have been allowed to remain here, and it's disgusting and abhorrent that they were able to stay here and obviously commit that heinous crime that they did go on to, as well as the one before that, which they were convicted well, for. All of it, yeah. So I think that ultimately, what's very clear here, again, is the Church of England has yet again got questions to answer. Justin Welby seems uh, uh, reluctant to look into it and is trying to deny any culpability, even though he is the head of the Church of England mm -hmm. as well. You are correct that judges should be held as accountable as anyone else when it comes to decisions that are made, whether they're right or wrong, and we should have that ability to have uh, people held accountable. Is it the case, though, that judges are not allowed to comment on cases they've been involved well, that's with? that's conveniently what we've just been told, yes, when we've gone to comment on this particular case. Mm. Yeah, which is, which is remarkable. Um, I'm just reading something that's literally just come through to us now. Home Office sources are tonight laying the blame for Azidi's case firmly 
at the church's that door. That is so unfair. Briefing the Telegraph... Let me finish and I'll go to you. Briefing the Telegraph that churches risk undermining the integrity of the asylum system. Sources also report that the Home Secretary had called a meeting with the vast majority of churches following Azidi's death. Um, I think there is... Well, I mean, I know there is, because I've been banging on about it for quite a while. Definitely a case to answer from the church. But, but I mean, in this particular instance now, it's all very well and good having a, a letter from the church. It's all very well and good having all of that. If you've got a serial proven liar, a sex criminal, and someone that the Home Office is telling you uh, is using Christianity purely for their own personal gain. This is the judge's fault, well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it's, and it's the Home Office's fault. But I don't think these conversion claims or the church... The church is going to baptise anyone. The church is going to say, oh, yes, we are here, we, this Churches is what we should do. Churches shouldn't baptise anyone. They, but, you know, people get baptised for all sorts for them, of reasons. They don't then have people to get baptised to get into certain schools. People get baptised to get and married in a church. That's an abusive they, But hang on a minute, hang on a minute. This is, this is a problem with the Home Office completely because the Home Office has granted asylum to a double sex offender. And then the when... The immigration judge has. When, no, originally, the and then he went to the Court of Appeal. And when, when in, in this judge's case, mm. they, it was, they, they didn't include the convictions in the evidence. So that judge didn't even have have information on the on the double sex offence. I would argue he's got more than enough to knock this case The information back. that he had was actually quite intriguing because it said he went to um, church for four years. It was quite compelling evidence, in fairness. And if you didn't know about this double sex... The, the point I'm making is... The point I'm making is he should never have been granted asylum you on the, the judge basis... didn't know that he was a this convicted was, sex it, offender? No, it shouldn't have even got to this appeal stage. It feels like this appeal stage is extraordinarily generous and he should have been detained. Look, and if, if you've got someone, OK, who has to have a male chaperone in a church just in case he decides to flash someone else or sexually assault someone else, Emily, why should that person be allowed to walk the straight, same streets as you? Well, I don't think they should. And I think across the board there is a consensus that Abdul Azadi should never have been allowed to stay in this country, should never have been granted asylum. It doesn't matter if you're on the left, it doesn't yeah. matter if you're on the right. Everyone agrees. My concern is that there are other cases like this that yeah. we don't yet know about and that our asylum system, our judiciary and the Home Office are completely letting us down on this front and the Church of England is complicit and, too. Emily, you say through charities. naivety, through naivety, but I... also an element of conspiracy. Well, but I would say, right, look, well. Emily says that on the left and the right there's a united view on it. Sadly, there isn't, because what we see on in the House of Commons... this particular case. But what we see in the House of Commons every single time is that every time we've tried to bring in legislation to toughen up not just the Home Office procedure, but also the legal framework in which uh, the, these abuses mm -hmm. and these human rights lawyers do good as a using in order to keep these type of dangerous criminals in this country, the Labour Party continuously yet again but, votes yeah. against all these measures and uses because... their peers in the House of laws I, to block and delay I, what I mean, we're trying what to this, do. I mean, what this case shows, does it not smash a coach and horses straight through this narrative that, oh, well, look, we see we accept 80-odd percent of I asylum think... cases, therefore most people coming across the channel are genuine asylum seekers. No, not if we're letting monsters like this in. I think we need to detract from this heroes and villains narrative. It's really unhelpful to think well, that even, unhelpful either case, either asylum it? seekers well, are really good or really bad. Is a oh, villain. No, well, yes, we can. In the, in the, completely in the minority. But my point is that He's a, he was he failed. His asylum claim failed. So why, when it failed, was he not immediately detained and deported? But this happens time so what and time I'm again. saying is the, asylum, people are the appeals. To, people are allowed to appeal right, multiple point. times yeah, and that, on different grounds. And that but is that's something what that needs to change. The government surely. actually were thinking about changing. Off. But to be fair, the you know the bill had, was watered down from its initial conception. Well, I would, I, so I would, but if you look at the safety Rwanda bill, the, the prime minister actually has really narrowed down mm. just what type of appeals can be put in place. We're obviously hiring additional immigration uh, judges in order to make decisions. Decisions, absolutely they should be held accountable you, for those decisions I'm sorry, and should. transparent with the public. I've got no issue with I that. I want an inquest into this, seriously. I want an inquest into this. This judge, Joe Hanlon or whatever, needs to, needs to account for the decision. If you can't decision. deport a double sex offender, you're not going to deport anyone to Rwanda, really, oh, realistically, are you? Well, so, so, when you say about deporting, right, right. the problem is Labour's talking about, example, where we'd have returns agreements. So the Labour Party seriously going to say they're going to get returns agreement right. with the Taliban in Afghanistan or Iran. Well, they're the, talking nonsense. By the, the way, problem is the Conservative Party have a plan by the way, the to get people to Rwanda and it's the Labour Party keep blocking us being able to do that. That's the, the, point the, 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 the Taliban today, by the way, have just announced that they are going to recommend stoning women to death. So uh, I think we can all agree that, uh, you know, fantastic job that we did over there, bringing them lovely Western values. Coming up, as one in five 2019 Tory voters say that they are going to switch to reform at the next election in a record-breaking poll, has the Red Wall 
turned his back on the Conservative Party. Tonight's no. panel will get no. stuck. Will no. get stuck into that. He's got some skin in the game now. But first, I bring you an interview. I bring you an interview with the Israeli brothers and October the 7th survivors who have gone viral after this run-in with a Manchester airport border official. Knock the attitude off. We've made the decision and you're coming in. So just let us do the checks we need to do and keep quiet. Look at me. OK, you clear with that? Good. We're the bosses, not you. Yeah, their testimony really is quite astonishing. And it's next. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. Do you mind if I ask you a little bit about Sebastian? Um, I just, it really amazes me how a mother um, who can lose a child in such a shocking and unexpected way, so little, so precious, can then turn that grief into something so positive. How did you find the strength to get up, um, get a camera crew, as you say, travel to the other side of the world and investigate all of this? Um, I was angry at Sebastian for dying. Um, you know, you feel like saying, God, I, 32 years later and I can still get very, very upset about it. I was angry that something that, that while he while he was born and lived with me and slept and then died, they were actively campaigning in New Zealand to try and stop this happening because they had a very high cot death rate there. Um, they had the, the, the lady, uh, the Anne Diamond, if you like, of uh, New Zealand, a, a television presenter called Judy Bailey, went on telly every night and said, if you're just about to put your baby down to sleep, put him on his or her back, not the tummy, and this will help. And there, cot death rate plummeted. And I went out to New Zealand and met her, and it was anger that drove me to come back and demand that we have the same advert here, um, the same campaign. And, of course, I got all this complete nonsense from the Department of Health saying, you know, oh, young mothers do not watch television, I was told. In other words, while New Zealand mums were being told how to save their babies' lives. We actively denied British mums that advice wow. during the time that Sebastian and others were dying. And, and the other point I suppose to make is it's helpful to educate all generations because when I think when I had my mm. babies, my mum would say, oh, he's not settling, just stick him on his tummy, he'll be much happier, that's what we did with you. And we had to say, well, things have changed mm. and, you know, yes. but it's about educating everybody because it's not everybody. just the mums Everybody's... that get their hands on the babies. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. Now, to the allegedly anti-Semitic border force confrontation that many say shames Britain. As we first reported on this show last night, the Jewish Representative Council of Greater Manchester has demanded an urgent investigation after two Jewish survivors of the Nova Music Festival massacre on October the 7th faced this, quote, aggressive officer at Manchester Airport border control simply because of their Israeli passports. Watch and listen. Checks we need to conduct, no, okay? To Nobody's saying that. Country. Nobody has said that once. So knock the attitude off. <laughs> We've made the decision and you're coming in. 
So just let us do the checks we need to do and keep quiet. Look at me. Okay, you clear with that? Good. We're the bosses, not you, all right? Well, the two men on the receiving end of that border force barrage were Jewish Israelis Neria and Daniel Sharabi. The brothers are survivors of Hamas's horrific terrorist attack on October the 7th and had come to the UK to share their experiences and raise awareness for charity. And the hostages, of course. They suffer from PTSD and were left severely shaken by their ordeal at our border. And the brothers joined me earlier today for a tell-all TV exclusive. I started by asking them how on earth it escalated in the way it did. Naria tell them that we are Jewish. Uh, we was in the Nova Massacre on October 7, and we, we come here to share the sto our story with the community, with the community of Chabad and with the community of Manchester, and to bring awareness to our story and about what happened to Israel. And when the guy understand that this is what we're doing and this is who we are, he decided to start the interrogation. Uh, on us and start to ask a lot of questions and after a while he put us on the side go sit on the side we need to check your uh, papers uh, after two hours some more uh, he called us back and he say and Ria asked him why, why why are you doing it why, why what are we doing what are we doing wrong uh, for what because we are a Jewish uh, and this guy say uh, exactly like this. We, do, we want to make sure that you're not going to do what you're doing in Gaza here. It's something that bring you up everything from October 7. That you come share your story and then you, you face with anti-Semitism, uh, not from civilians, not from people that think yeah. other way than, than you, from the officer. The board. Well, how, how is it? How has it made you? How has that made you feel about uh, Britain and about us as a country that someone who works in a position of authority could say to you that they want to make sure that you don't do here what you are doing in Gaza? Well, um, my feeling was that I'm not safe, and in, in the minute that he said it, I'm realized that this is anti-Semitic, pure, and. If I'm going to say another word, maybe I, I'm going to be arrested to, for the next day. And I feel afraid and I get every, everything back from the October 7th. And I decided to shut my mouth and just to say, OK, OK, OK. And then we just go back to my hotel and we, we don't leave the hotel just for the event that we're supposed to talk. And that's it. Two days and we don't leave the hotel. I don't feel safe to walk around here because this is this is officer. And if someone in an official job uh, treat me like this, I, I I don't feel safe in this country. And and probably that I'm not going to send also my friend here to share their story because maybe they're going to to get the same treatment. And this one should should never happen to anyone. It's not about your. If you are Jewish, if you are a Christian, if you are Muslim, you, you are not supposed to feel like you are a terrorist without any reason. And actually, I, I know that at least for the couple of next years, I'm not going to go back to, to England, at least uh, until that I get apology for the police, for someone. But mm -hmm. now I'm not feel safe there and I don't want to be here anymore. Well well, what makes you think that it was anti-Semitic and not a border officer doing his job? He, do, he want to make sure that I'm not going to do here what I do in, in Gaza. This is the first thing. And the other thing that he asked me after that he saw my Israeli passport, he asked me, what is my religion? You know, he already see that I'm Israeli. So I realised that he probably confused if I'm Muslim or that I'm Israeli. And Jewish. if I'm Jewish, and from the, the moment that I said that I'm a Jewish, I, I look in his face and everything changed. The look, the, his faces, the act. And, yeah, the act, and, and they start to, to look in each other and, and to be happy. 
and smile that they all did us. And when I uh, tried to say something, he said to me, uh, sit over there, don't move. You are not supposed to do do what uh, what we uh, going to tell you. I am the boss, not you. And things that you make you feel that you are a loser. That the feeling that he yeah. gave us, this is the England, not not yeah. to the Jew. He hit the Jew. He hit what we doing in Israel. And you know what? My best friend is a hostage. My best friend for the last year, eight years. Mm-hmm. You know what? You know why? Because he go with me to the party and celebrate to have fun. And when the terrorists arrive, he doesn't run away. He stay and help to the injured people. And this is why he get kidnapped. Till now. 171 days after, still a hostage, and I need to face to, with, with this kind of people in the airport. James Cleverly, our Home Secretary, has said that he's going to investigate what happened to you at uh, Manchester I hope. Airport. I hope. What do, what I do hope. you want to you see, see done? I, I, I think that this, this, this officer not should be... First of all, we need to get uh, we need to get apology, apology for, for both of them. And after this, to well, make sure that... It's not going to happen again. Yeah. Yeah. To other Jewish, you know what? Because if some of the Nova survivors come in here and speak and stuck on the border, maybe there's not two brothers that's strong and can handle it. But he's going to arrive to his hotel and broke to hell and cry for all the night because he doesn't know what to do with himself. That was the Jewish Israeli brothers, Neria and Daniel Sharabi, who were detained at the UK border allegedly for anti-Semitic reasons, speaking to me earlier from our Westminster studio. A Home Office spokesperson said this about the incident. We are aware of the complaint made against Border Force staff at Manchester Airport and we are investigating these claims. While the facts and circumstances are being established, it must be reiterated that we do not tolerate anti-Semitism in any forms, anywhere. If only Border Force were that tough with everyone, eh? Coming up, Cadbury has been accused of erasing Easter after rebranding Easter eggs as gesture eggs. And tonight's panel are ready to hit back. We'll also bring you the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. They are hot off the press. It is the liveliest paper review around. This is Patrick Christie's tonight. We are only on GB News. Hi there. Time to look at the Met Office forecast for GB News. Rain and hill snow across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours. Showers moving in elsewhere, although interspersed by at least some brighter interludes. Low pressure still well and truly in charge. That low mainly sitting towards the southwest of the UK and it is sending a band of rain north during the evening into Northern Ireland where some wet weather could cause issues, rain warning in force, as well as central and northern England parts of Wales and then eventually that rain moves into Scotland where it mixes with cold air to give some snow above two or three hundred metres. The far north stays dry but chilly And further south, some clear spells, although the next area of rain moves in by dawn to affect southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. Heavy downpours, gusty winds, and then that rain, well, it tends to turn to showers as it moves into central UK by the afternoon. Further showers arrive later from the southwest with gusty winds, hail and thunder. A lively afternoon, although with some pretty clouds in the sky. Now, in the far north, we're going to see wet and windy weather remain until Thursday morning. And then Thursday starts off bright across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, for England and Wales, a blustery start with further heavy rain to come, followed by showers. And those showers developing fairly widely as we go into the uh, Easter weekend. I suspect Good Friday, Saturday and Easter day. Mostly we're going to see sunny spells and showers before more prolonged rain on Monday. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. 
Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. It's time to bring you tomorrow's news tonight in the liveliest paper review you are likely to get anywhere on the telly. Let's do it. We go in with the Metro. Heartbreak Bridge. Search for survivors as crossing collapses like Hollywood movie scene. Yep, it is, of course, the Baltimore Bridge. Baltimore Deadly Bridge on the Independent. Deadly Bridge Collapse, again, is the picture story. It really is kind of the picture story, isn't it? BBC set to make wealthy pay more for the licence fee. Director General Tim Davey announces the corporation's biggest ever public consultation to consider the introduction of means-tested TV licence fee as the cost increases for everyone to £169.50 a year. Right, let's go to the eye. State pension age may rise to 68 sooner to pay for triple lock pledge. Can we all just accept that we're probably going to be working forever? and then just be done with it. Once you let that wash over you, right, life becomes a lot easier. We can all move on. Oh, I'll never retire. Lovely. Anyway, people aged between 47 and 48 expecting to retire in 2044 could now face a longer wait for their pensions if the triple lock remains throughout. Right, let's go to the mirror. Traitors. The Brits fighting for Putin. The mirror today exposes two British traitors fighting in Ukraine for Russia. They are called, apparently... Ben Stimson and Aidan Minnis, and they are in the Donbass region with Vladimir Putin's forces. Uh, former British Army Commander Colonel Richard Kemp says they're a disgrace. There's also at the top of the Daily Mirror, Harry and the Rap Stars sex party lawsuit, uh, which I must say, the one good thing to come out of P. Diddy's uh, incident that's going on is that we heard our newsreader Polly Middlehurst say the words Puff Daddy live on air earlier. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the Telegraph. Picture story, massive ship, hits bridge, bridge El Calapso. Church is undermining asylum system. We do that a heck of a lot. Uh, two thirds of magistrates' cases are held behind closed doors. Yeah, we know that. And NHS satisfaction at the lowest ebb. There's also a little one at the bottom there. Tories pour cold water on BBC licence fee rise. And The Guardian, just to round it off, CBI stops staff discussing sexual misconduct and bullying claims. And they're also talking about the astonishingly high level of poo in the rivers. So, with that in mind, I welcome back into the fray my press pack, GB News presenter and superstar Emily Carver, the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. And boy, does that feel good for him to hear. <laughs> Jonathan Gullis, <laughs> MP, and author of broadcast. Shock Amy, Patrick is what you mean. Amy Nicole Turner, it was only maritime. Right, let's focus in on the independent front page. It's also at the bottom of the Telegraph, of course. BBC set to make wealthy pay more for the licence fee. Jonathan, I'll start with you on this. So should they be means testing the licence fee then? Well, this is Tim Davy just covering his tracks with the fact that the free licence fee for those in, uh, elderly, which obviously the BBC were funded for, that the BBC agreed to keep free, obviously you turned on their behalf whilst paying their mega stars like Gary Lineker silly sums of funding in order to uh, make us, you know, watch the telly tax essentially, which is a disgrace and abomination. It's very simple. It's time to bin the licence fee once and for all, make the BBC stand on its own two feet, compete like any other broadcaster, such as the excellent G GB News, and obviously uh, the sooner the better the licence fee goes, the better for everyone else. Mm, go on, Amy, your view on the old licence fee. Should it be means-tested? Well, when I saw this and it said make wealthy pay more, 
I thought, well, now apparently Beginning. in the UK, if you if you earn over 100k, you, you're not wealthy yet. So maybe mm. this will just be reserved for the 171 billionaires in the UK, which would be fine. They can pay mm. loads. They can pay for the lot, in fact. I suppose it does depend on what you class as wealthy, doesn't it? And I suspect they're not going to set the bar particularly high. And if that. Jeremy I mean, Hunt sets it, fine. They're in a bit of a mess, aren't they, the BBC? Because uh, fewer and fewer people are actually paying the licence fee, yeah, so they're going to yeah, have to yeah. get the funds somehow. So of of course, they say the rich should pay more, which fine, but it's not a long-term solution, is it? But maybe no. they should be looking at scrapping it for people on a certain... Scrap the licence fee, me. yes, no, you're no, there. No, 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 scrap no. the licence fee, well not done. Scrap the licence fee, but do pay more Parliament. attention to those on lower incomes who maybe can't afford the licence fee very readily. Or just well, like not have a licence fee at all. Like and then no-one has to pay. Or anyone. Like pensioners who used to have it free. Which they the BBC still, decided to you turn on. Still, yeah. Oh, no, that's TV licence. That's yeah. free. For yeah. pensioners. <laughs> all right, OK, now look, I am sure that you all recall when our former Prime Minister was crucified for having a bit of cake during lockdown. Well, it might surprise you to know that three anti-Boris MPs were let off for having their own lockdown parties full of booze and nibbles. A report released by the Standards Commissioner today found that the allegations against Virginia Crosby Eleanor Lang and Kangaroo Court Judge Bernard Jenkin, yeah, will not be upheld, as it concluded the event was, quote, socially distant and had both business and social elements. It's remarkable, though, isn't it? Because a WhatsApp message was sent out, apparently, in an invite saying that this was a party and there was a load of booze. Among these MPs was also Miriam Cates, as she attended what was described, and I'm just going to read this to you now, as birthday party drinks in the invitation. All right? Seriously. Does all of this sound a little bit too familiar? Um, I mean, there does appear to be a blatant double standard going on here, Jonathan. Well, all I'd say is, first of all, that the police had looked into this incident before the commissioner did, and the police found that there was no uh, complaint to be upheld. So, ultimately, I don't think the commissioner should be acting as judge, jury and executioner mm. if the police have actually already cleared. But what I will say is this. There are many Labour MPs who themselves, during the lockdown period, such as, and I've got it written down here, Patrick, Tahir Ali, acknowledged that his actions were wrong after attending a funeral at a time when the advice was for family only. I think over 100 gathers were at that. No investigation. Rosie Duffield met her partner in Canterbury constituency for a five-hour walk. Different households at that time. She took responsibility for actions. I think she even resigned as a Labour whip at the time. But again, no investigation from the Standards okay. Commissioner. Jeremy Corbyn apologised after he and his wife were pictured at a dinner party mm. for nine people, breaching the rule of six. Again, no investment by the Standards Commission. So all I'm saying is that there is fair to say that rules aren't always necessarily being applied equally to across the parliamentary spectrum. Mm. I mean, Amy, it, it does appear that that's the case, right? It's all right if you're a lefty... I don't and you broke so. lockdown rules, that's fine. I don't think so. And I think we, we often get, like, this Boris deja vu rose-tinted glasses. He was the PM, he's the Prime Minister, he's the boss, he's setting the Amy, what setting was he found guilty example. for? Um, for... This. For having a can of Coke and a Tesco sandwich because, in the because, cabinet. Because, but, it, but it wasn't just that, I'd was it? It was, it was deliberately misleading Amy, look at the video there. But do you think it's so wrong that the civil servants on the other side of the table didn't get a fine, but the Prime Minister and Boris Johnson but both did? How, many... how Simon Case not got a fine? Do you know how... what? I think people at home will be having a collective sense of PTSD looking yeah. at all this stuff. I mean, this really was a stain on our history. The way... I mean, the whole lockdown scenario, in my view, but the whole way that the media, the only story in town was That's what did Boris it. Johnson. Boris Johnson, this party, this party, this party, this party. Yep. None of them were really parties, let's be Frank, but yeah. of course there was wrongdoing. But yes, of course there were double standards. There was a concerted Absolutely. effort to get Boris Johnson out of the but door. Whether he deserved it or not is, of right. course, a matter of personal opinion. His own opinion. Sent but the of no course confidence there vote. were double standards. All right, we're moving on. We're moving on. We're moving on because it's another devastating blow in the polls for the Tories. As it's revealed that one in five 2019 Tory voters. Moving forward now, Patrick. Would now back reform if a general election were held tomorrow. So just 44% of those polled said that they would vote Tory again, with 20% now saying that they will turn to Labour. This is a new record high for reform, putting them in third place overall, with 14% of the vote share, while the Lib Dems trail at 12%. Now, this was, of course, all done before it was announced.
that our very own Jonathan Gullis <laughs> is now the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. So, hey-ho, things might... This might be the solution for the Tories. All of a sudden, you see polling data today. You're setting me up, And the Tories is a landslide <laughs> victory. You're setting me up, Patrick. Jonathan, that's a shocker there, mate. Look, let me be very clear. The overwhelming majority of the British public understandably have tuned out of politics at this moment in time. When it comes to the campaign and those six weeks, voters know very clearly there's going to be two choices. It's either Sakir Starmer or Rishi Sunak. So believe me, when they know that they have to make that choice for their children's future, a one man in Rishi Sunak who has a very clear plan to grow the economy, is in brought tax cuts in, will get a flight off to Rwanda, is actually taking on the judiciary, taking on these foreign courts to make sure we can get that flight to take place, investing in places like Stoke, refurbishing, reopening, Kids Grove Sports Centre, as you know. I'm very passionate about that, Patrick. £56 million for the levelling up fund, right. over £200 million for All our right. roads, £30 million pounds for our buses. <laughs> That's clear choice versus Sir Flip Flop, who has today been found out having a costed plan for £116 billion for some green agenda that no-one really understands, mm. ditching the £28 billion pound pledge, ditching his 10 pledges as Labour All leader, right. ditching you Jeremy really Corbyn as his mate. All right, this yeah. is the reality. All right, all right. All right. All right. All right. We'll read the manifesto. So we'll so we'll read the so it was uh, <laughs> been, been, been well promoted there, I think. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure your voters are going to come out for you. So, look, that you is... You haven't given so them Emily's enough on the to head. vote for. That's, so that, I totally accept, is the challenge for us as a party. Mm. It's to motivate years. those voters to come out. Well, we smashed Labour in 2019. Let's not forget that's why I'm here. So we <laughs> will make sure that we will motivate those voters and they have to see delivery on the All ground. Right. If we don't deliver, I've always accepted well, that we'll face the consequences. Time you're so deliver. much like that violin player on the Titanic as it sinks. I, I, mean, I, mean, <laughs> I, was, I was distracted by the actions yeah, as well. I was, no, oh, sorry, all, I was, all I was saying it's is... It's just the energy, the passion, he's not going to give up. Well, like, all I was saying is so Keir Starmer does not motivate... In fact, he's a huge drag on the Labour ticket at the end of the day. Everyone knows That's this That's not what clearly. we're talking about, Jonathan. We're talking about people going and voting for a OK, so... OK, so... Richard Tice is not going to be the Prime Minister. Ed Davies is not going to be the Prime Minister. It's right. either going to be Sir Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak, and the public will therefore back right. behind. So, Labour... And, by the way, Blackpool is a huge test for now for reform. Right. If Blackpool... If they can't come second convincingly, right. what does that really say? It means that unless Marjorie Farage is in town... Hostage to fortune there. Well, we'll see, won't we? But all I'm telling you <laughs> is this. Richard Tice only got, what, 13% in Wellington right. Britain? I think right, that was an absolutely dreadful fine, result. Fine, fine, Look, I, I tell you what, I've had a kicking or two in Blackpool in my time, so there we go. Now, what? Uh, yeah, I met some right. GB News for, uh, fans in Blackpool the there other are. week. Look, Blackpool's full of and sound people. That's why they let you yeah. conservatives. Right. Everybody, shut up. Right. So, <laughs> uh, no. Don't the you talk to me like that. The company... <laughs> sorry, yeah, I'll try and forget. Uh, That's going to be an awkward, uh, awkward ride home the now. The company <laughs> Specsavers have built a bit of a reputation for eye-catching adverts. Do we remember this classic starring GB News's very own John Cleese? Please insert the key. I have inserted it, you Briton. Insert. I'm gonna teach you a lesson, nasty little. Nice guy, John. But if you're looking for inspiration for their next ad, uh, there's no need to fork out millions to some advertising fat cats. A delivery driver in Edinburgh has provided the goods. <laughs> Yes, a Specsavers <laughs> van was caught trapped on top of a bollard on oh. Castle Street with a sign right next to it reading, Caution, automatic bollards in operation. <laughs> no parking. It writes itself. No, I know was what that you're not all the thinking. advert? And don't say... Oh. No, that's a real thing. That's oh. a real... <laughs> coming up, coming up, coming up. Is it ever OK to cut your nails on public transport? A bloke sat next to me on the tube this morning. That's the picture I took. Not sorry. Yeah, we were going to have a death penalty debate on this, but apparently that's too, <laughs> <laughs> that's too extreme. OK? Find out I when I crash. Like like Greatest Britain and Union Jackass for next... Easter is cancelled by Cadbury's as they rebrand traditional Easter eggs as jester eggs. So, or gesture, even. No is it way. understandable societal progression or the unacceptable erasure of Easter? My panel, decide. <laughs> and it's next. That, that. Um, just... This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Now, what's going on in Scotland? So they're implementing these draconian hate speech laws, which are going to come in into force on April the 1st, I kid you oh, not. Ironically, yeah. And then, um, basically, you can go to your local mushroom shop or whatever. Which I didn't know we had mushrooms farms in Scotland no. because people aren't that keen on vegetables up the road. They're, they're... Um, <laughs> but, 
<laughs> not even a shiitake. Um, <laughs> but you can report a hate crime at these private places, but you can do it anonymously, and then the police will, uh, I don't know, unleash the hate monster. I, I don't know what, how this works. What's going on? I think the hate monster <laughs> is mythical. Yes. And um, I don't think the hate monster actually exists. What I do think is existing, I'm genuinely really worried about comedy, right? Yeah. Now, believe it or not, some people in Scotland, they're wrong, but they don't like me. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that a lot of time is going to be wasted. You know, if someone yeah. calls you a name in a shop, you probably deserved it, believe me. Um, also, called... comedy can be quite offensive, particularly yours. And I'm not necessarily sure. As I've said on the show before, I remember my mum was worried when we, we, Scotland had decided that all um, residential properties needed special smoke alarms, and my mum was convinced this was to do with the hate crime and that there was a camera in them. And... I, I, I don't think she's being that paranoid. I mean, <laughs> Scotland is a kind of nanny state. You know, actually, Hamza Youssef, when he implemented the hate crime bill, put a, a subsection in that which said that they can criminalise you for things you've said in the privacy of your own home. Thankfully, Scotland doesn't have the largest arts festival in the world. Oh, wait, oh, no, it does, no. it does. It actually does have that. And lots of comedians are up there. Now, we had this before, because if you go back about to, uh, to 2000 and, what was it, 2003, when New Labour were trying to push through their racial and religious hate crime bill, well, the comedians are silent now. They're Something forgotten. has completely changed. There's been a gear shift. Oh, I mean, it's... in the Irish hate crime bill, which is it, it, which going through at the moment, they actually define hatred as hatred. Brilliant. It's a complete circular definition. Well, well, yeah, well, absolutely. And that tells me, when something's woolly, that tells me that it's not going to be applied fairly. It's going to be applied according not. to the person applying it. This is Patrick Christie tonight. It's time to return to some more of tomorrow's front pages. Let's have it. So... The Sun. Harry's named in P. Diddy sex traffic case. There's affiliation within there, apparently. The Daily Mail, Clapham chemical attacker asylum fiasco. Judge doubted his account. Look, we did a uh, big piece on that earlier on. Um, and The Times. Just one in four say the NHS is working. I'm surprised it's that high, to be honest. Confidence in the service is the lowest on record. Waiting lists of blame for the dissatisfaction. And half back... Oh, half back higher taxes to boost care. Yeah, all right. And when we're done with that, what we'll do is we'll get your life savings and we'll go outside and we'll set it on fire. Yeah? Because that's exactly what that is. Anyway, moving on. Uh, here is my panel and it is... Uh, well, obviously, it's Emily, Emily, Jonathan and Amy. But hot off the heels well, of King's Cross Station putting Ramadan messages on their departure board, Cadbury's have sent Christians into a meltdown over their rebranding of Easter eggs. Signs have been spotted selling the chocolate eggs under the woke rebrand Gesture Eggs. This has naturally caused a stir as yet another example of traditional terms being erased in the name of inclusivity. One memorable example was when Brighton University staff were told to avoid using the word Christmas. Instead, they used winter closure period. I mean, Jonathan, what on earth is going on here? The Easter eggs, isn't it? It's woke. That's it. It's work. It's not work. The problem is not enough of us are going to church, so therefore they think they're going to sell more if they call them something generic. Do you think? Yeah. Do you think that's Literally it? Literally just for sales. Boycott Cadbury's, Amy? I don't think there's a correlation between buying Easter eggs and people who go to church, because I would say 100% of people buy well, Easter eggs. Not necessarily eggs, church, 3% but of people go Christians. to church. No, I don't think that's real. I just don't. Well, few people are identifying that as Christians. That is from some yeah. like random little gesture, corner, then you can buy them whatever religion you are. Who cares? Who cares? Who gesture, by the way? Who cares? I'm, yeah, I'm why would you bored don't of these rebranding things. Don't be a snowflake. Things. I'm not a snowflake. I just don't understand why you've got to rebrand something called call an Easter egg. Easter egg. <laughs> it's an Easter egg. I like Easter eggs, you, okay? You, you, That's why I look like this. That's the problem. You can call it that. No one's stopping you calling they it are. that. They are. Cadbury's are trying to take away my Easter eggs with gesture eggs. One run Who wants a gesture egg? Why would you land on the word gesture as well? It's a rubbish word, isn't it? It's a ball. Who came up with that idea? Gesture egg sounds like a fertility app or something. <laughs> it does a bit. I <laughs> call does. it a spring egg. Spring egg. Or, no, just that would at least be made more sense. Like, <laughs> no. Did you see the hot cross buns thing as well with the ticks? That would make you feel... What? Yeah, that you, was... you, I can't tell you, you're exploding. They've not changed the cross, on the, the, they've cross changed the cross to a tick. It's called a hot cross bun. It's it, called a hot it's cross bun. It's in the name. Bun, it's yeah. in the damn name. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Now, you need to redirect no, that no, no, fury. No, no, no. no. Now, look, this, as anyone who follows me on Twitter, at Patrick Christie, uh, will Shame know, will know, if you travel on the Tube in London, you will be familiar with all sorts of grim sights. But this morning, I came across something that shocked me to the core. Here is a gentleman who got his nail clippers out and decided to trim his nails on the commute, leaving behind a trail <laughs> of nails for the rest of the passengers. And he looked me in the eyes, I tutted, okay, 
And he had, by the way, he looked exactly how you'd imagine. Can you tell us, right. show us the tuts? Shaved, shaved, shaved sides of head, complete you know, drags, absolute drags. And he looks at me, he looks at them, and he just got off and walked on with his day. Now, death penalty? <laughs> so Patrick, I feel thing? like you need a hug. I do. I'm here to give you a hug about this. I know how triggered you are. I understand why, but if Emily was not going to provide one, I'm here for one, OK? Well, you know, what? You know what, Patrick? Mm. I imagine you've done worse on public transport. Ooh! That GB sounds intriguing. News exclusive. Here we go. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> Share the pictures, Emily. Oh, Share yes. the pictures. We've all got a past. <laughs> um, no, but I mean, on a, on a serious note, that is vile. It is disgusting. It is vile, isn't it? It is yeah. vile. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's almost as vile as a gesture egg. I mean, I don't oh. know what I'm more furious about tonight. It, it I could think be worse, it's... though. It could be the toenails. I'm sorry, but this indicates everything about societal decline. All right. You, a couple of days ago, I was walking home from the <laughs> studio and I saw someone pooing in a phone box. <laughs> what? Yeah. And then I get to Tesco's. You on did my, it? I think, yes. And then <gasps> I get to Tesco's on my way home. They don't let you go through the automatic doors without someone opening them for you because you've got too many people nicking stuff. And then I get on the tube this morning and someone's cutting their flipping nails. Where do you clip your toenails? What is this country? Like, where do you clip your toenails into? Because in my household, that's quite a debate. Um, it is. Well, you my husband do gets it furious. Into the bin. Where do you do it? Into the bin? Into the bath? Into the Not loo? On the Not tube. on the tube. That's the. Right. <laughs> Can you give us a demonstration of the tut that you gave? <laughs> it was. I feel like you could have, I feel like you could have done that better. Uh, I feel well, like you let yourself well, down. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Blithering Joe Biden never seems to fail <laughs> making a blunder, even in the most serious conversations. So here he is today making a statement about this tragic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. See if you can spot what's wrong with this. At about 1.30, container ship struck the Francis Scott Key Bridge, which I've been over many, many times commuting from the state of Delaware and our trainer by car. Well, there is only one problem there. The bridge did not have any train tracks, apparently. Oh, is that what he was saying? So, yeah, so he was saying he'd been over the bridge, apparently, on train tracks, <laughs> and that, that, that it doesn't have any. So, mm. you know, there is a slight issue there, isn't there? Well, now it's time to reveal today's greatest Briton on Union Jackass. Emily, who's your greatest Briton? My greatest Briton is a former SNP advisor, Professor Mark Blythe, for saying Scotland would become a mini Argentina if they get independence. Now, as a unionist, I want the union to stay together. So I think he's, you know, worked towards that goal. Although he's actually backtracked a little and said that he's oh, no longer going to talk about Scotland because his words have been weaponised. But, you know, I Bye. think it's a good thing for the unionist movement. Right, OK, all right, fine. Bit of a um, stretch, maybe. Jonathan? <laughs> I'm a sucker for a teenage football sensation, so Kobe Mayno making his England debut. Great thing to see, even though I'm a Fulham fan by upbringing and a Vale fan, of course, mm. where I represent Stoke on Trent North. Uh, by, uh, well, not by necessity. I don't you dare, Patrick, disperse <laughs> my name like that. My children are being brought up to support their local team. But what I will say is, what a great thing to see yeah. for another England youngster talent. And hopefully, hopefully Euro success all right. coming down the track. OK, <laughs> go on, Emmy. Is your greatest Britain? It's a school, actually. It's the Royal High School in Edinburgh because they've become one of the first secondary schools to install vape detectors in their toilets because I can't stand vapes and especially children. Mm. OK, vapes. all right. Gosh. Today's greatest Briton is Cobby Maynou. <laughs> Whee! Get in. Manchester United fan, three and three. Right, OK, so... Not the uh, random S&P advisor. <laughs> no, no, who, was since, who has since backtracked on what... Anyway, right, OK. Right, we're going to be, we're gonna have to be very quick with this. Emily, who's your union jackass? Man cutting nails on tube. Yeah, strong. <laughs> strong. Go on, Jonathan. Labour Party for a £116 billion black hole and their green energy nonsense. OK, go on, Amy. Um, Gillian Keegan for doubling down on Jeremy Hunt's claim that 100 k a year is um, not that much, actually. OK, all right. And uh, today's union jackass is man cutting nails <laughs> <laughs> on the tube. <laughs> Hang your head in shape. I've got a picture of your face, right? Maybe I didn't he doesn't put it on the have telly. a house. I didn't put it on the telly. Um, can I just say a massive, massive area? It was disgusting. <laughs> so I hope you bump into bigger. <laughs> I, I, I hope I bump into bigger. I will have a better touch next time. I will do nothing about it. Right, OK. Um, look, thank you very much. That's been an absolutely rip roaring show. Thank you very much to everybody who's been watching us, crucially, and not the football as well. It is much appreciated. Mm. Can I urge you to go back and re watch, especially the tops of the hours? You can go on YouTube, you can watch it back. Uh, we had a, a really, really interesting uh, discussion about, um, of course, Abdul Azidi and the latest migration madness there, and also posing the question, how many asylum seekers are there in Britain who have committed sex offences and do we have a right to know about it? But up next, it's Headliners. I'll see you tomorrow at nine. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather.
on GB News. Hi there, time to look at the Met Office forecast for GB News. Rain and hill snow across northern parts of the UK during the next 24 hours. Showers moving in elsewhere, although interspersed by at least some brighter interludes. Low pressure still well and truly in charge. That low mainly sitting towards the southwest of the UK and it is sending a band of rain north during the evening into Northern Ireland where some wet weather could cause issues, rain warning in force, as well as central and northern England parts of Wales and then eventually that rain moves into Scotland where it mixes with cold air to give some snow above two or three hundred metres. The far north stays dry but chilly and further south, some clear spells, although the next area of rain moves in by dawn to affect southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland as well. Heavy downpours, gusty winds, and then that rain, well, it tends to turn to showers as it moves into central UK by the afternoon. Further showers arrive later from the southwest with gusty winds, hail and thunder. A lively afternoon, although with some pretty clouds in the sky. Now, in the far north, we're going to see wet and windy weather remain until Thursday morning. And then Thursday starts off bright across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, for England and Wales, a blustery start with further heavy rain to come, followed by showers. And those showers developing fairly widely as we go into the uh, Easter weekend, I suspect. Good Friday, Saturday and Easter day. Mostly, we're going to see sunny spells and showers before more prolonged rain on Monday. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. It's the final week to see how you could win big. You could win an amazing £12,345 in tax-free cash that you could spend however you like. Plus, there's a further £500 of shopping vouchers to spend at your favourite store. We'll also give you a gadget package to use in your garden this spring. That includes a games console, a pizza oven and a portable smart speaker so you can listen to GB News on the go. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. This is Louis Walsh, and if you're watching this year's series of Celebrity Big Brother, you will, you will know uh, what Louis Walsh has been talking about. It is the fact that he's been di diagnosed, or he's had a battle, with a rare blood cancer, and nobody 